Hi, and welcome to the first episode of the Pai Huai Tau podcast. One of many, and you know, what better way to start this off, to start this whole podcast off, than be talking with my good friend Ian. Hi, Ian. Hi, Wyatt. <laughs> um, well, I'm super happy to be here, a fan of the channel for quite a long time. Probably my number one fan, to be honest. Yeah, I, I don't know whether that's uh, somebody proud of or something to, to look in the mirror at night and wonder why I'm doing this, but it's uh, the, this channel is, is uh, one of my favorite things to listen to on a long drive and oh. uh, um, I'm looking forward to the future pro uh, projects that come out um, and uh, my one of my personal favorites I have to say uh, I was actually an enthusiast of the Wobba Gong song oh so one of like two people that like that song yes in fact but um, yeah you, you put out a lot of a lot of cool stuff so I'm glad to be guest number one so to speak yeah well I'm happy to have you here so I just threw my fucking phone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but happy to have you here. Uh, really, as I mentioned, there's like, whenever I envisioned like podcasts on this channel, it was always with you, and it was always with some type of cigar or a pipe. Of course. And we we're close. We tried to get this set up outside, and it, it just didn't work. The outside's not not great for that. But um, I'm happy to have you here, regardless. We'll smoke later. So. Yes, excellent. Yes, that that has to be on the agenda. It can't be a true meeting of the two of us. Yeah, without, exactly. You, without you, having some good puffs. Exactly. So, um, so um, I asked you earlier today what we wanted to talk about. I was going to leave it up to you. And, you know, we had some really good discussions about numbers mm -hmm. and kind of the, uh, like, a point of view, like how one frame of reference you could see numbers in one light and one frame of reference you could see them in another. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to say about that? Like, what would you tell all the five fans listening to this show? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, when we started talking about doing this in a podcast form, I was thinking a lot about talking about Japan and World War II and uh, a lot of the numbers that you see bounced around in World War II and in, in all sorts of conflicts as uh, trying to apply a deeper meaning to it uh, and really giving some of the backstory on specifically Japanese bonsai tactics in, in World War II, but really... In discussion with that um, and with Wyatt and him talking about the Belgian project, um, it's just it's such a such a reminder that all conflicts and all stories around the world are full of um, large number gaps and telling those stories because, as I like to say, each tick mark has its own story, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what really boiled this down to, um, really just expanding it to be telling the story of those numbers because they're easily forgotten and, and it's not easy to conceptualize a digit yeah i agree uh, we're shaking my head here and i'm shaking the plants on the table but um <laughs> yeah no i i really agree with that i think um one thing that drove me to things like the belgian project and kind of what we were talking a bit about earlier today is like when you think of a number you see like you know 2000 well you uh, you were you mentioned a bonsai charge at murder cove in, uh, um, in Japan, I, I or was, it was in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, yeah, there was one that was on Atu Island, and I'm 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 guesstimating the numbers here. I, I'm pretty close, but it was around 2,600 Japanese soldiers involved in this bonsai charge, and I think it was 29 that came out of it. Wow! It was just totally a, a hopeless last act. Uh, but I think it was interesting to note that was the only one that took place on U.S. soil during World War II. Yeah, true, true. Um, it's easy to forget that in the in World War Two. Oh, it's it's fun to say. Oh, it never came to U.S. shores. But even though it was far out in the Aleutian Islands, it, it actually did. It did. But uh, yeah, twenty six hundred twenty nine remain. That's just mind boggling to me. Yeah, and for me, like the thing that really gets me is we were we were we touched upon this a bit earlier, but like, you know, the the people of the time might have been different. You know, we're American, mm -hmm. right? Um, but even with the disparity in culture and language, right? All those 2,500, however many Japanese soldiers died, like had lives, like just as vivid as ours, right? They might've liked different things, had different things to go home for, different reasons to fight or whatnot, but they all had lives just as vivid and colorful as yours, as mine, as yeah. the person listening to this, right? Um, so it's, uh, it, for me, you know, on the topic of like the bonsai charges, it seems so pointless to just charge that away. To just, uh, to my mind, throw it away. They they didn't see it that way, you yeah. know. But to me, it's you know, like you had so much more to go home for, like mm -hmm. not not die in a cove for. 
Right. But 25,000 of them clearly thought differently than you and I yeah. do. And 29 might have thought similarly, or maybe they were wounded and didn't have a choice. Yeah. You know, I don't know. But Yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating, and it kind of goes to the historical point of how as we move forward through the years, it seems like the sanctity of human life has been put on a higher and higher pedestal. Because mm-hmm. even when you think about like the classic film from the American West and like uh, two guys having a disagreement, all right, I'll see you out in the street. You know, <laughs> it's like, so, and, and the whole culture of duels and, you know, we've had founding fathers in this country that have, have had lives cut short by duels and that's just not that long ago. That's only... Uh, 200 or so years ago roughly 250 years ago so that's that's three or four people ago that that stuff happened and it's really not that long ago in our history and these bonsai charges that we're talking about there's still people alive from that time and, and yeah now, right now yeah exactly and, and these days in the modern military we go to such a such a distance to uh, save a single life I've heard many stories about um, flying you know cargo missions like rerouted pick up one injured person and take them from Germany back to you know, the East Coast of the United States to give them medical treatment. But meanwhile, you had those commanders in the Aleutian Islands on the Japanese side who decided these thousands of men under my command, there's no hope, so there's, there's no use pleading with the enemy. We're just going to go squash their lives and, and in a way that maybe the history books will look favorably on when we hopefully win this war. Um, so... It's, uh, it's interesting how through the years we change our view and, um, and maybe it's because life back then was so much more fleeting and there were so many things and forces that would squash us out. Going back to the American West, I mean, if you look up any big name from that time, you see died of tuberculosis, died of some disease, this or that, or uh, violence in some regard. These days we don't have that on such a widespread scale. Um, so the numbers are getting bigger in this day and age, but we, uh, it, I suppose it's a good thing that we're so much more passionate about our fellow man. Yeah. You know, kind of to two of the points you made, one about how, like, life was so, f- like, fleeting. Um, in Incan society, before um, contact with the Spanish and into contact with Spanish, uh, babies weren't named until they were something like three years old because life in the mountains, all that, was just so hard. So you know what they called them? Wah wah, <laughs> so a pretty pretty fitting name there. But like, what I have to say is like the I, I really do think I, I agree with you there. Like the the way that we're living life now, like I think there's a direct like correlation between like the life expectancy and like the health that we're able to have now as opposed to back then. Yeah. I, you know, there has to be something that or something I was thinking of while you were talking is um and maybe in conjunction too is like. The fact that we're able to be connected with so many more people from so many different cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not just unique to us here in the United States, right? We have that all over the world. But the fact that you can, like, you know, you have people here who love K-dramas, for mm-hmm. example, right? So they're able to see, like, a to us, a pretty foreign way of life. Like, the way people live in Korea isn't mm-hmm. exactly the way people live here in the United States. So I wonder if that, like, connectedness in terms of, like, TV, radio, internet, stuff like that has an impact. Um so I don't know. But something else yeah. you said really stuck with me. You said um, when you were talking about the Japanese commanders, you talked about, like, let's throw away, like, thousands of lives, mm-hmm. right? And you, you've mentioned it and move on, but, like, could you imagine somebody doing that today? Like, throwing away thousands of lives over an island? Mm-hmm. No, right? And so it's just interesting, the difference, because at some point in some time, it was very okay for somebody to do that. And you know, here we are talking about it now. You know, right? And you have to you have to think of the mental shift that's taken place because, as one of the foot soldiers, one of those thousands of foot soldiers in that one instance that we're talking about, you have to think and when you hear that order, the first thing that has to go through your mind, if you're a, a rational individual, is my commander completely sees me as expendable, and that's got to be such a hopeless feeling. But also, it comes down to ideology so much because. They were, in fact, willing and excited for the prospect of giving their lives for the emperor. But I can't help but think that in the back of their minds, being humans, human nature prevailing as it always does, that they dreaded it. Yeah. And that they were like, why am I in this situation right now? Why is this person that I 
respect with authority and not respect the unity of the term. And that is what separates, I think, the, the mood in the military today is that we care uh, by and large about, um, about regardless of the rank of what, you know, it, it's about the smartest man in the room. And uh, I heard, I was talking to someone the other day who is a maintainer in the RAF and uh, he was working on engines on, I believe, the Harrier. And when they would have um, meetings about maintenance issues that they were having, mm -hmm. he was, you know, one of the middle enlisted ranks. But the culture in the RAF at that time, or, or in that culture, was such that he had the engineering authority of a lieutenant colonel. Wow. Yeah. So captains, lieutenants, I'm not even sure what the what the rank structure <laughs> yeah, translates yeah. to over there, but let's just you know use our own American one for, for the sake of this conversation. But um, yeah, he had that. So the, the lieutenants and the captains had to step aside when this guy stood up because he was the one who was spending oftentimes eight and ten hours a day inside of you know the, those engines, making sure they're working right. So today, by and large, we have a culture of respecting each other more and. I'm really glad that we have that. And it's a tragedy that only in one lifetime we've had any combination of that. That was the point I was just about to make. Like, it's been like less than a lifetime, right? right? There's still people alive now that were mm -hmm. Japanese soldiers potentially on the the islands like Attu and the you know the Aleutian Islands. It's just crazy that, in a, in a good way, type of crazy, like almost like wholesome that we've evolved so much culturally in such a relatively short amount of time because. You know, you were talking about it earlier, like, our founding fathers had this disregard. Like, going back before then, like, do you think Crusaders had any regard for life? Like, yeah, probably not. not as much as we do, right? Yeah. yeah. But, like, it, like, the Inca, like I was saying, they called their kids Wawa. Mm -hmm. They're almost like a joke, you know? Right. Like, I'm sure, obviously, very sad if something happened, but, like, it was baked into their culture. Yeah. And, like, going back, like, the Romans, they had the Colosseum. Like, on that That's topic, example, yeah. could you imagine watching the Colosseum? I couldn't personally like I I think you know I've seen the movie Gladiator right <laughs> like yeah. you know I've seen it there but like for me like in in like the back of my head like it's fake you know like I know this isn't real it's a story right but to actually watch that not only like watch that but like in, in like the documentation of the Colosseum you had people that really really liked it mm -hmm. and like and just to kind of like talk about one thing in particular um, the Romans did their executions during like what we would consider halftime of a football game mm -hmm. isn't that crazy like I, I can't like you're already so disrespected and then they're just going to execute you during halftime and like the audience could choose what they would do some of the times right, right? like oh what are we feeling today a little little flame some mm -hmm. lions <laughs> you know like but could you could you imagine being there like with all of our modern sensibilities right yeah going back and like watching that like cry i'd like cry i don't know right make it yeah. stop you know like I, I don't think i could handle that yeah, so definitely not it's crazy um, that they could and that was completely fine yeah you know and to them it was the same way as us watching the football games on the weekend yeah exactly that's exactly what it was like and that's so foreign to us that's so unbelievable that we could have that mental shift over a period of a couple thousand years um but also while you're talking about that i can't help but think about being i suppose i can use the term the victim mm -hmm. the one about to have that happen to me yeah. and th and just knowing in my mind that once this happens in just a minute or two this place is going to erupt in cheers and yeah. that's just i mean of course at that point i'd be dead so who cares yeah but who cares just the but that would add insult to injury and just be so painful on top of the pain that you know you're about to physically experience yeah it's literally about to be the most yeah. traumatic part of your life and for somebody else they might forget about it in a week Oh, if not, you know? if not by the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If not, right. like, yeah, by, by the ship gladiator combat exactly. later, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, by the start of the third quarter. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, but also while you were talking, I was thinking, it is a story of human triumph that we don't think that way anymore. I mean, it's very easy to think that we're lost in this day and age and this whole planet is going down the drain. Um, and that's partially because we look to the news and the news reports on things that does happen. Like they the bleeds it reads, you know? Right, exactly. They don't report on things that don't happen because that's not interesting to people. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's there's sources that can give you good news, but that's not going to get the clicks like 
the bad news will, the, the things that's really going to make you angry. Um, and getting exposed to that stuff constantly, it makes our blood boil, and that's it's very easy to fall into the trap of only bad things are happening in this day and age. But perhaps the simple fact that in one lifetime, we've completely changed our mindset on how to fight wars. And if you go back another lifetime or two, you think about how they were fought in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, mm -hmm. where you literally, like a volleyball game, stand there in a field and take turns shooting at each other. Yeah, pray That's, you don't get hit yeah. when it's your turn, right? And pray yeah. you hit someone when it's your turn to shoot, you know? Exactly, because you need another five minutes to reload that. Yeah, see that, that thing. That cannon. So, um, so, yeah, I think it's, I mean, we have, we have more numbers to discuss, but it's still just, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that through all this tragedy, and it's kind of already a little bit of a morbid start, but we can't help can't help it when we're talking about the vastness of some of these concepts. But thank goodness that it's not like that today, and I think that that's a reason for us to smile. Yeah, you know, I've heard people refer to our time as the Great Peace. Yeah. So since the end of World War II to now, and you know what? Now it feels sometimes like we're closer to ending that great, like that Great Peace, than we ever have. You know, and maybe that's just my point of view, not having lived through the Cold War and some of like, the struggles that that brought. But you know, things feel scary right now in some cases, especially over in like Eastern Europe and Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. You know, um, but I think even with that happening now, it's we're still like by and large much, much, much more peaceful as like a society, as like a like a species even than we ever have been. You know, and I actually I'd be interested to see like. Has there ever been a time where we've been more peaceful? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Maybe back when we were picking berries and <laughs> you know, yeah, chasing so. off chimps. In but certain parts of the world, maybe. But, yeah. Um, yeah, and also in this in this day, we have such accurate rep record keeping mm -hmm. uh, that we can deal with that stuff. And and there's just large swaths of people like and doing a little bit of reading into some numbers of that time today. I, it's just there's gaps that are mm -hmm. incredible. Like I, I know, I don't know the exact figures, but I think in the the Russian army, it's estimated between nine and fourteen million. That which that's a gap of five million people unaccounted for. And I I was reading about Hideki Tojo, in the uh, during in Japan during the during World War Two, and he was saying that directly responsible to him is estimated between three and fourteen million people. That's incredible. That's incredible, but I think the thing that sticks out to me about that is that's 11 million people. Unaccounted that, that, for. Yeah, unaccounted right. for. So what that's saying is, of course, that 14 million people, that, that's 14 million people that are gone. They're just they're just arguing semantics. They're just arguing the number to put yeah. it to him. Um, but the simple fact, simple fact that there's 11 million people that are like, oh, we're not sure. We're not sure how to classify these people. If you break that down, think about just, like 11 of your closest friends. Like even then, you, most of us today, we don't have 11 close friends. And then you add on the million to that number. Yeah, it's or just almost inconceivable, yeah. you it's, know? It's inconceivable. And scale is such a weird thing. Like um, when, I mean, we we uh, have the experience of going to a college that was, I don't know, roughly 17,000. Yeah, 16, 17, 18,000, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, and that's, that, that's, and we walked around, I, I mean, for the, the four years that I was enrolled there, I, I never really, um, I never, I would have entire days where I would go around and be like, I've never seen any of these people before. Yeah. Like, it just seems like all these are new faces. Every single day I would see at least someone that was like, huh, they just make a mental note. They're like, huh, I've never. Yeah, I've never seen that. Yeah, I've never seen you before. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, it's wild how just that number qualifies as massive. Especially in most of our minds, I mean, I, I, I would imagine you're familiar with Dunbar's number. Have you heard of what that is? Mm -hmm. So Dunbar's number, uh, it's it's basically an estimate of how many people we can hold as close oh, relationships. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's they came to the number of about 150, so yeah. we can keep to. And it's the way they classify it is like if you're in a restaurant or at a bar, and they this a person walked in, would you invite them to sit with you or not? And mm -hmm. that that kind of number, those kind of that level of a close, close relationship mm -hmm. uh, is is the amount of people that we can basically keep in our our mental data bank, and they think it's about that number because that's the size of the the clans and and 
Yeah, back, yeah, back in the yeah. Yeah, way back in the day, and that's how your Ken brain, groups. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how the human brain developed back in our chimp days. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that that's pretty fascinating to me. But when you multiply that by however much you get to just get to seventeen thousand, that's a massive gap. So, and then to get to eleven million, yeah, and then right? to jump even from there to one million to yeah. eleven million, it's, it's just incredible. it's it's a it's 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 a ladder that the rungs are too far apart for us to grasp at. Yeah. Um, so scale is just incredible. And when I read three to fourteen million today, that was uh, that was the thing that hit me was just wow, it's eleven million people. We're just not sure how to classify them. Yeah. And also we were at the the Academy Games the other day. We were. So, we were. Yeah. Navy versus Air Force. Um, and uh, we had a a, a the end the end score was expected. But <laughs> uh, aside from that, I I remember um, one of those that were with us at the game. Uh, she that. On the opposite side of the field, there was the Air Force student section, and they were all in their blues. And um, we, I remember one of us asked an alum, is that like your freshman class? And to which the alum replied, no, that's our entire school. Yeah, like 4,000 like, people. Yeah, 4,000 people. And we thought it was like a class, yeah, you know, because no, where we yeah. went, we have, it was a class. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. The, the, front, the front few rows is, uh, is all the freshman class, or most of the freshman class. And for us, it was probably a, a region of seats that was – Half the size of the line section, maybe. Yeah, that. yeah, maybe. And that's yeah, I mean, that's our entire school. And that was when I when I heard that said, and I was like, wow, that's it's perspective, and yeah. perspective fascinates me. So, I think that perspective is something that history, at least in like my experience, has really brought out. I think if 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 like learning history for as long as I have, and my longtime viewers will know, I'm a <laughs> big history fan. Um, yes. I, I can definitely. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think the thing that history has taught me, and I'll throw language learning in there too, um, that has been the most beneficial to me is empathy. Um, being able to look at numbers like, you know, six thousand to fourteen million or something, and be able to try at least in part to put a, like put a face and put like a life with that, mm -hmm. you know, because as we were talking with like the like Japan and stuff like we mentioned earlier, everyone there has a vivid, colorful life. You know, that's just something like every time, like I get talking about numbers, be them big, be them small for your various tragedies, be them war related or not. Like you have to think of the people, you know, and uh, actually this past weekend, there was a, like a soccer, like crush on, in the news where like 127 people, like yeah, raised it to 175. Wow. Something like that. And to think that like, they were going out for a soccer game, yeah. you know? They're going to do something fun, and it unfortunately ended horribly, like terribly. And those people were all had lives just as visit, like vivid as ours, yeah. and that was it. Their mistake that day was going to a soccer game, you know? And it's just it's tragic that that happened. But I think as people, we can't just look at the numbers and be like, wow, that's big. All right, next news mm -hmm. article, right? You have to like right. really stop and think of, those people and try to empathize and mourn with them because that's in my opinion that empathy is what makes people people yeah so absolutely uh empathy is so important and, and we have to keep that in mind and i think that uh, goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how back in the day empathy was less widely regarded and now we have such a, a value for human life I mean, yeah we, now we go the extra mile as opposed to how it was just about 80 years ago it's uh, it's heavy, and when you think about one person, I mean, all you have to do is think of yourself. Think of all the intricacies that each of us have, and all the all the things we don't like talking about, things that we love talking about. The skeletons about. in the closet, and yeah, all the fun exactly. little quirks we all have. Absolutely, yeah. and we all have plenty of those um, quirks. That is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I hope you yeah. have a lot of skeletons <laughs> in the closet. Well, some more than others, yeah. uh, but we all have a number of things that add up to make us us and when you multiply that by you know going back to the tens of millions number again when you multiply all those intricacies by those many millions that's so many things to account for and it's so many stories and when we think of ourselves we think of all of our passions all the people that we know all the people we hold in high regard um all the opinions that we have and humans are incredibly opinionated creatures <laughs> yep. um, and there's
through so many things. And I can't imagine being in a close-knit environment with somebody and also in a position of authority with someone and ordering them into a situation like what you saw in Act 2 Rome. And, yeah. um, and that's just, that's, uh, that's incomprehensible to me to, to have someone trust you and know that you are not only looking out for their best interest, but the best interest, therefore, of their uh, family members and everyone that associates with them, and you're just going to cast that away in the blink of an eye. That's, uh, that's heavy stuff. Yeah, and you you know you just said it, but the uh, the family members and friends like that's a, a part that I feel like is often not talked about, right. like the the cultural scarring from an event like that. And I yeah. think one of the places that was really well shown was in the Pals Battalion in World War One. What would happen for our viewers, if you don't know, is people from the same school, same club, um, all from the same town, would join up um, together to fight in World War One because they needed people and like what better way to do it than do it with all the people you're already close with, right? Right. Which at a first glance seems like a good idea. Yeah, but then yeah. one shell changes that mm -hmm. and now the entire like Liverpool soccer team is gone. <laughs> yeah. Right? Or like an entire like freshman class at a college. And to think of like it doesn't just impact that school, but in that case it impacts all the families that had sons or daughters that attended right. that school, right? So I think the the cultural scarring is something that it's hard to quantify, but is certainly there and certainly ever present when you're talking about the numbers. So yeah. just something to keep in mind. It's um, something I thought about way back when I was doing cultural anthropology classes uh, <laughs> back in college. But yeah, something that's certainly present. and. I don't know if you could quantify it. Like, yeah, they had a, a large dose of right. cultural scarring. Like, how do you even begin to, like, put that into a box? You yeah, know, I absolutely. don't think you do. I think you just try to heal, um, get a lot of therapists for your country, I guess. Yeah, so. I guess so. Um, yeah, something that uh, I'm thinking about is if you take, let, let's say that on the subject of, of bonsai charges, let's, let, let's attribute a number for it, and let's use the size our college let's take s around 17,000 all right and would you say it's fair that that everyone in the world has eight close family members that's being very generous but we would say that sure yeah eight, eight yeah we'll, we'll go with eight and if someone has less than that then you can fill in the gaps with you know close friends and those kind of things so if there's eight people who would be massively devastated at one loss if you take 17,000 and there was plenty of instances where more than many more than 17,000 um, were lost and we were just talking about like three to 14 million right yeah so if you take 17,000 in quick maths divide uh, multiply by eight you get 136,000 people that are affected by an instance of 17,000 men lost on the battlefield wow and it just multiplied multiplies very quickly and then you take the potential number of people they could have interacted with in their lifetime and it's all those things changed and imagine how different this world would be with all those people there and mm. all the offspring that they would have and the potential best friends we would have today yeah exactly um, yeah like the the yeah. new social could all the the, the uh, just about infinite possibilities yeah. you know for how they could have been a benefit to mm -hmm. not only their community but like the world at large yeah. and that's it yeah you don't get that so right and you flip that coin and you think that it could just as easily have been you or me that are not here and uh, some other people that our ancestors knew in some XYZ war that made it and you know that just a, a different stroke of luck and they would be here having this conversation or we would never yeah exactly uh, it's it's it gets pretty deep to think about and it's almost like a an innocent survivor's guilt in a way it's mm -hmm. like how how are how did we make it? Yeah, when so many people did Yeah, uh, so many people, so many, so many potentially yeah, talented potential, people. Yeah, exactly. Think about all the problems that could be fixed by this time. Um, with, the right person yeah. would have been born, you know, yeah, from their grandparents who wouldn't have passed away back in who knows right. how long ago, you know. Yeah, and that's not even something that we can. 
part of the board is just all the lives that are cut short and what would have come from those lives. So, and I think on the same side of that coin, like how incredibly lucky we are to have our chance to float around on this rock in mm-hmm. space, right? Yep. Like any number of things could have happened to my chimp grandfather yeah. like 40 generations <laughs> removed, right? Yeah. Like he could have got a finger cut and died of like tuberculosis, you right. know? But I'm here, you yeah. know, by, by hook or by crook. Yeah. Here we are having this conversation and right. might as well take advantage of it. Yeah, butterfly and, effect. It's a yeah, weird series of events. Um, I guess the, <laughs> the butterflies flap of their wings made the tornado in Texas, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Here we are, we're the tornado in Colorado, as it were. But yes. <laughs> as we gaze out at your beautiful mountain landscape and out the window. Oh yeah, and for the viewers who are imagining this, think of like a rickety apartment complex, <laughs> and then like a tip top of a little mountain poking up <laughs> behind it. That's all we can see. Uh, what a beautiful day it is. But um, I'm always fascinated with perspectives, and I think that it's really important to. Try and try and take a step back uh, and disassociate yourself from your most stringently held views and try and relate with someone else. Right? There's a simple exercise, like uh, not bringing up anything political, but I'm just saying that for whoever this viewer takes as their you know their, their big political the, the person they would vote for. Just try and think of something positive to say about the opponent. Yeah. Just if you're unable to say anything good about the opponent, then you're way too close-minded. There's your wake-up call. I mean, there's there's good sides of everyone, and there's with with few exceptions. There's there's good sides of pretty much everyone, and most people, I think, I think deserve the benefit of the doubt at least a couple times. Absolutely. So. And I think that empathy that we've been talking about, that perspective, like it definitely applies to people around you like that haven't died in some a two mm-hmm. bonsai charge, right? And I think something that most of us could probably do better is like taking that empathy even for like people that you might take for granted in your life, someone who you've like been friends with for like forever and you can say anything to them, right? right. But having that, that empathy even then to really think like, okay, so let's like walk a mile in their moccasins. Or better yet, uh, like somebody that you might be really mad at in a moment, right? Like let's say you're driving and you get cut off and it's a, it's a close shave, you mm-hmm. know? Like try to – like maybe something's happening, you know? Um, I always think of when I was growing up, I was out at one of my friend's aircraft hangers. And um, we were working on like either a car or an RV or something. Mm-hmm. And um, this car comes st- – flying down the uh, the taxiway yeah. um, and flashing their lights and uh, my friend's dad was a cop and I remember in that moment like after he had like said like oh in his experience that his he, he thought that perhaps that car had been stolen uh, because his experience had led him to believe that right mm-hmm. and I know for me I didn't even question it I was like yeah that's what happened right and there are so many other things that could have happened right. and I didn't even think to consider and what actually happened is that car wasn't stolen. A plane had crashed, and they were driving because they knew the pilot of the plane. So that's why they were driving at something well over 100 miles an hour, just watching the car go by and flashing their lights and honking their horn. They were trying to get our attention for us to follow them, and we didn't because we didn't think to consider the other possibilities of what could have happened. So even in situations where you might be taken aback, right, it's good still to try and apply that empathy, even if everything is telling you, no, that's a stolen car, right? right? So, Yeah, absolutely. We all have inherent biases, and that's what makes humans humans. Uh, and, of course, it's, it's a great thing to say, well, we shouldn't go through life judging people. But, I mean, to a certain extent, that's how we, that's how we crawl through this existence is by making small judgments. And that doesn't mean that anyone's a bad person because they do that on a small scale, but that's that's how we get through life. And uh, but also knowing how to compartmentalize that with you know a moral sense of good and bad and what's right and wrong. I think if you can find a happy medium between those two, then typically you're on the right path. 
and directing your empathy toward items and people and creatures that deserve it. That's uh, that's what those Japanese commanders didn't do when they ordered bonsai charges, and that's what we can learn from that. Absolutely. And, and take into the future in our careers and our lives and anyone be anyone listening to this careers and lives. Um, so empathy, perspective, those are the two words that I would encourage someone to to, to Google again and get a and reinforce your definition of those words. It's a it's been a lot. Absolutely. I, I don't think I could have said it better myself. <laughs> I could try. I could BS for a while, but no, there's. I couldn't have said it better myself. I, I, I get lucky every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> well, great talk, and thank you for being here and being willing to do this. And it's something new that we're trying here, but um, thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having this channel, oh. <laughs> uh, and it's in its infancy. Um, I know that. It's it's gonna get massive one day, and, and I'm excited to be on the ground floor. Oh, I'll give you merch for free. Dude, thank <laughs> we'll you. call it good. Thank you. You know what? That that's fine. That's fine. And all the money that this this video, oh, yeah, video all, is gonna make. Someday. All the money. That's all yours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, please. But uh, yeah, occasionally a free ball cap would be nice. Yeah, I so. could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Well, well, thank you for doing what you do, and thank you for having me on. It's it's, it's, it's been a so pleasure. Awesome. Well, as I end all my uh, all my videos, I think it's time for us to hit the old dusty trail. So, <laughs> in our case, the old smoky trail. Yes, we got sir. a couple cigars. Yeah, we got to relocate about ten feet. And go yeah, light, go light them up. <laughs> all right, let's get to it. Excellent.